May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. It's so good to be with you all this morning and with you all. A week ago, I woke up from a dream in panic. My dream was about today, actually this very moment. In my dream, I look down at the bulletin and I see my name by the sermon and my stomach drops and I begin to panic because I did not prepare a sermon. And what's worse is that I didn't have anything to say. I was too caught up and busy worrying about presiding, you know, because I'm a baby priest here. In real life, I'm glad to report that the dream was not an omen, and I have prepared a sermon. But the feeling of not having anything to say or motivation to say something made its home in me this past week. And I think I know why. Because this, this is strange to stand here in a pulpit looking into a camera with lights and and empty pews with only a few of us here. Simply put, I miss you. I miss being in community with you. And really, I think it is that I'm tired of mustering up the energy to do something that just feels utterly dissonant and strange. This is such a strange time we live in. Really, it's a time of uncertainty. We can't really plan ahead with any any certainty. I can be certain of that. Some of us don't know when we'll be able to go back to work or if we'll have any work to go back to. If we'll even have school in the fall and if it will be in person or if we can attend the funeral or a wedding, or have a party in our house with our friends. When we'll be able to hug or high-five someone who's outside of our safe germ bubble, or to enjoy the bustling environment of a busy restaurant. Never thought I would say that. Or be together to sing here in this space and fill this room with a joyful noise. It is truly an uncertain time. And if you're anything like me, when uncertainty increases, I try to grab for things that I know to be certain. However, it is often done in unhealthy ways. You know that pattern. Like when it's much easier to point a finger at someone else and blame them, when clearly you have responsibility or you're even able to make a change. That's what I do. Or maybe you double down on what you know is right and wrong, becoming rigid and stubborn, trying desperate to create certainty and control. Or for others, maybe your fuses are shorter and you're quick to label others as good or bad, in or out, unreasonable or not. When we frantically grab for certainty, we become the judge. We become God. And not only do we do that to other people or our very institutions, we also do that to ourselves. We can label ourselves as all good or all bad, trying desperately to remove the bad. All along, not realizing we might just be removing the good too. When we try to rely on ourselves alone, make ourselves a keeper of the universe, we start to forget what our role is as servants and followers of Christ. Today's reading, I believe, has something to tell us about this pattern. In the 13th chapter of Matthew, we see Jesus trying to explain the unexplainable, and listeners are desperate to understand. This chapter mainly comprises of parables about the kingdom of heaven. We heard some last week, we heard another this week, and we're going to hear more next week. Each one gives us a different angle, a different glimpse, a different morsel of truth too big to understand. 
And I gotta say, today's text is challenging for me because it wrestles with the notion of good and evil. And it's not so much that good and evil exists, I get that. It's more so what happens in the end, the judgment, the gnashing of teeth, the wailing, the throwing out into the fire. How do I wrestle with that part of the kingdom of heaven? I mean, what if I'm the weeds? Ooh. When I'm faced with challenging scripture, I like to do an exercise where I notice who in the story I'm identifying with. Whose eyes and ears am I reading and hearing this story through? Am I the sower, the seed, the reaper, the servant, the field, the weed? I pay attention where I go first. And for me, the first time I read it, I went to the good seed. But then I play around sitting with it from different perspectives. So about on the third time of reading the text, I was drawn to seeing this parable through the eyes of the servant or the slave. Partly because it's the only character in that story that Jesus does not explain who they represent, which was really curious to me. So let's go there. Let's dive into this parable through the perspective of the servant. First, a little background about Matthew. The audience who first heard this story uh, from Matthew were folks who were trying to figure out their own identity as followers of Jesus. Followers who still had a really strong sense of their Jewish identity, some even still worshiping at the synagogue. All the listeners were impacted by the destruction of the temple and the mass chaotic violence of the Jewish revolt. Needless to say, life was not like anything they had experienced before, clearly uncertain, trying to create new ways of understanding themselves and looking for clear footholds to figure out who was in or out, good or bad, who could be trusted and who couldn't. In the middle of all of that, along comes this parable where there's weeds are growing amongst the wheat. Now, this weed that Jesus is referring to in this parable is a weed that actually looks exactly like wheat. It's indistinguishable from wheat until it's ready to harvest. And then we have this character of the servant who comes in confidently, no doubt, and wants to pick the weeds. This servant is so eager to attend to the field, to clean it up, to help, to do their job. And the householder says, nah, don't pick the weeds, because in doing so, you would remove the good seed as well. Let them grow together. Let them grow together. Here's my version of the conversation. Servant, say what? So you want me to leave them? No weeding, householder. Yep. Weeds and wheat together in the field. Yep. Cool, 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 cool. End scene. Okay, let's, let's keep going with this. If we imagine ourselves as a servant and we obey, we let the weeds and wheat grow together, and we must carry on attending to the field, a field full of wheat and weeds. We water the wheat alongside the weeds. We do everything we can to make sure that both grow. If this is our only job, to nurture and tend to the field, I wonder if our relationship with the weeds change over time. Or if we become less certain, we can tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds. When we spend such intimate time with both, our hearts must change, wouldn't you think? The householder invites us to change how we spend our energy. No longer do we spend our energy looking to pluck out and destroy. We get to offer energy of life, nourishment, and opportunity for growth. I don't know about you, but that feels freeing to me. That feels like good news. To be told to not expend my energy condemning, pulling weeds, destroying, or plucking out. Because who's to say we know the difference between good and evil? Or if we do, in destroying the evil, we might just destroy ourselves or be overcome by it. Instead, we are asked to be about tending to life and liberation. 
And it's at this point that I can't help but think about Jacob's dream in the reading of Genesis as a possible response to unimaginable uncertainty and grief. See, right before this dream that we read is when Esau, Jacob's brother, is looking for him to kill him. Because Esau is so enraged that Jacob is getting his father's blessing. It sounds actually like the enemy planted some bad seeds in Esau's soul. And so we hear his parents desperately begging him to flee, to go, to save himself. And it is there on the first night in the wilderness that he has this dream and God comes to him and promises life abundant with descendants for generations. And when Jacob awakes from this dream, he says, surely God is in this place. That God is amidst the uncertainty, pain, and is there with Jacob when he is on the receiving end of evil. Jacob had all the right, all the right to point back to Esau, to get revenge, to cast a judgment, to pluck out him like a weed. But no, Jacob is profoundly aware of God's presence right there with him, going so far to proclaim that the gates of heaven are here and is very close at hand. Beloved, in this parable of the kingdom of heaven, we are asked to indiscriminately love, to offer life and nourishment, and to tend to the world, to one another, and to ourselves. To be with the parts that are both evil and the parts that are good, especially when we can't dare tell the difference between the two. Let us cling to that certainty that surely God is in this place, that God is the ultimate judge and we must only love, attend to the world, provide life and nourishment, for we are standing before the gates of heaven. Amen.